So I'm in Manchester, England at the Spring SGM meeting and I'm with Jeff Almond, who is the recipient of the Colworth Award. And Jeff is a virologist from Sanofi Pasteur, someone I've known most of my career. We used to work on the same virus. That's right, polio and rhino. That's right. So I want to know how you became to be a virologist in the first place. Interesting story. I, I did a bachelor's degree in microbiology and biochemistry. And in fact, I started a PhD on the role of desulfur vibrio bacteria mm -hmm. in sedimentary rock formation in river estuaries. And they, they do that because they, they make sulfide deposits. Yeah. And, um, and I realized after a few weeks that they really needed um, you know, I, I think an earth scientist to study that problem because the bacterial role was relatively minor. They needed a geochemist, in fact. Mm. So I, I then quit and found myself in Cambridge with my girlfriend, then wife, now wife, and um, she uh, she started a PhD down there. And I stumbled into Brian Mahi and Dick Barry, and uh, talked my way into a project on influenza virus, right. and never looked back. And then eventually you had your own lab and worked on polio for many years. Yeah, I worked on influenza uh, in your lab for well. my PhD and for my postdoc. And then when I got the chance to build my own lab, I switched to picornaviruses. And, you know, we were working then on the vaccine, the oral polio vaccine strains, and trying to understand why they differed from their virulent wild types, what those mutations were doing. Uh, and why, you know, why had they lost their neurotropism, but tackling it from a genetics point of view, understanding right. the sequence and then which mutations were important. So we worked all that out for type 3 initially and then a little bit more on type, type mm -hmm. 2 and then type something on type 1 as well. So looking back on that basic science career, would you say that was your crowning achievement, the polio neurovirulence and attenuation story? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I did some pretty nice work on flu as well, mapping uh, TS mutants to the genome segments, getting protein coding assignments on the genome segments, doing that all about the same time as, right. as Peter Palazzi and others. And uh, we did it for the avian influenzas, and, uh, and we did it without knowledge of what he was doing. He was just slightly ahead in his publication. So that, that was pretty good as well. And I had a, an interesting paper in Nature in 1977 on showing that a single gene controls the host range of influenza, mm -hmm. and that's now the famous PB2 gene, which we've heard a lot about right. in this meeting. I remember that paper because I used to work on flu as well. Yeah, in fact, absolutely. our careers are sort of parallel. I started in flu and went to polio. Exactly. The same with you yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So do you think we can eradicate polio? Well, we've already eradicated serotype 2, right? Apart from the odd few bits of it that we see in these long-term excretors, like yeah. the Birmingham man that we've, mm -hmm. we've talked about. Um, and I think that the eradication of, of polio 2 is, is a really encouraging sign. In mm -hmm. I mean, clearly we've driven out wild polio from many parts of the world where it was. Um, and the fact that type 2 seems to have gone now mm -hmm. is, is, I think, great news. Um, it's distressing what's happening in Pakistan with the oral polio vaccine uh, uh, nurses that have you know, been killed. And, and, and we need some renewed, not only effort to get the vaccine in, but some renewed you know, publicity, education, to get mm -hmm. these guys to back off. Or maybe we need to switch early to IPV in those countries to try and get the sense that it's a new vaccine coming in, not tainted with, with those silly yeah, suspicions yeah. That, that, that we've heard about. But I think we have to move, yeah. And it, I mean, interesting point that when I first joined Sanofi, mm -hmm. you know, we, we were and still are the biggest producers of IPV. But today we have a capacity which is way, way higher than when I joined the company um, because of the realization mm -hmm. that, that we've had in the last decade that as we get closer to eradication, we've got to switch to IPV. And then we've got to maintain IPV for who knows how long, but probably a couple of decades at least after the wild type viruses have gone to make sure that we maintain a polio free world. If, if, we, if we get to a polio right. free world, we've got to maintain it. A couple of and, decades. Well, you know, the Birmingham man guy, the long term excreter, that guy has been shedding, shedding virus for, yeah, for a couple yeah. of decades. Yeah, we don't so know how many individuals like know, that there are. We don't know that, yeah, we don't, I mean, 
we don't know how many such individuals there are, uh, but if there are any, any, and we stop vaccinating, they will right. be shedding virus in the non sure. into a non-vaccinated community, and we don't want to risk that. Right. So yeah, I think we're we're in for IPV usage for quite a long time to come, and if it's tucked away inside a combination vaccine with DPT and Hib and Hep B. That's fine. You know, mm -hmm. It can be accommodated mm -hmm. in those com combinations at relatively low cost, um, and it's no extra shots. Right. So right. you know, so it makes sense to do that. So and so we need those combos now for the developing world as right. well as the developed world. So during this period, will polio be a BSL four virus because it's eradicated? And if so, how do you make IPV? <laughs> yeah, good. Another good <laughs> question. Well, we would argue, you know, at the industrial level, that Sanofi Pasteur can do this very safely at what we call a BSL-3 plus uh, okay. level. We have really fabulous state-of-the-art uh, production facilities. Now, if that is not enough, I don't know what we're going to do, because that's yeah, really the yeah. biggest supply. Now, you know, there have been some moves, of course, to move to Sabine strains for IPV right. on the grounds that that could be safer. And, and I think, you know, there is some merit in that, but there are a lot of drawbacks. A, the yields are lower. B, it's not exactly immunogenically the same, and we can't right. be totally confident that you give the breadth of coverage that the IPVs have given. Um, but also, I think, it doesn't really get you home safety-wise, because we know that if you get Sabin out, if it escaped, it can mutate and it sure. can become virulent. Right. Right. So it's not as safe as you would like to be. So I think we, we continue at BSL 3.5 or 3+, plus, uh, and do the best we can. And maybe, maybe what's coming as well is expression of the capsid region mm -hmm. in a way that gives you a non-infectious supply of, right. of virus capsid. And I know the guys working on foot and mouth have made some recent good progress mm -hmm. on that. And I think if you've got the right expression system and can get to the right levels, that is potentially a way mm -hmm. out of this, this containment argument. But I think for the time being, uh, we're going to stick with IPV mm -hmm. as it is. But you now have an example of a vaccine that gives you immunogenicity but not protection. Is that right? We have one puzzling observation mm -hmm. for one serotype of one, right. um, yeah, one, one vaccine, which is our dengue, right, right. you're referring to. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, and, and it's, we've just published this in The Lancet of last year, and it's, it's a real puzzle at the moment, one that I'm charged with trying to understand and sort out. And it is that our tetravalent dengue gave good immune responses as we measure them by a PRNT, um, plaque reduction assay. Um, and, um, you know, we see a good neutralizing immune responses right. after we vaccinate in a good proportion of people against all four serotypes. But when you look at efficacy, we don't see any efficacy for the type two. And we're getting good efficacy for type three and four, and pretty good efficacy for type one, but absolutely nothing <laughs> for type two. So what the hell is going wrong? And, mm -hmm. and on the basis of the neutralization, you'd say they're all behaving the same. And on the basis of what, you know, what is the protective immunity, you would predict that it's gonna be the same for each serotype. Sure. I mean, you know, should, as I've said, should in, be. In, I've said in my presentation, you know, you make an HPV, six and it works the same way as an HPV right. 11 and a, a 16 and an 18. You make an H1 influenza, it works the same as an H3 and an H5 and a B influenza. You know, you make a polio one, it's the same as a polio two or polio three, whether it be OPV mm -hmm. or IPV. So the idea that you need a different, fundamentally different immune response to protect against type two that our vaccine is not inducing from that that you require for one, three, and four seems to me to be it's unlikely. Right. So yeah. I think it, yeah. it points to a sort of technical issue with the type two, and maybe also two technical issues, one with the way the vaccine's working, that serotype mm -hmm. is working, but maybe also the way we're assaying it. And um, you know, it may be that we've got the same problem in, in each situation, and we, we think we're getting neutralization of the virus, but yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe it's, you know, there's something going on there. But people who are infected with type 2 develop type 2 protective antibodies, They do. Right? They do, right. yeah. So, it's so not natural exposure to type 2 gives protection. Yeah. And obviously you can't release the vaccine until you sort this out, right? That's a very good question. I mean, whether we can get licensure of a trivalent vaccine, yeah. which is a fourth component that is not active, I think is, a, is a, mm -hmm. again a question for the yeah. regulatory authorities. I mean, clearly in areas where there's a lot of type 2, our mm -hmm. vaccine is, is not very 
uh, not going to be very cost effective. Right. But there are countries, and of course it, it, it drifts with time, where you have very little type 2, and there's a lot of 1, 3, and 4. Now in those environments, uh, a vaccine as it is, would be useful. Um, sure. And you know, we, we need to really explore just what we can get in terms of licensure and how mm -hmm. widely it could be used. But clearly our, our priorities on fixing the type 2. Right, right. Now another vaccine you discussed yesterday was a possible influenza, universal vaccine, which many people are working on, yeah, including yeah, yeah. Peter Palazzi, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. having worked with him. Yeah. But what do you think? Is this, is, I know there are promising laboratory findings. Is this, in your opinion, going to translate into a product some, at some point? Well, you know, I, I'd be interested in what you think, Vince, but, <laughs> but it, 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 I mean, basically, you know, if you present to an individual a well-matched influenza, either whole or split vaccine, mm -hmm. you usually get a pretty decent immune response that neutralizes that virus and gives right. you uh, hemagglutination inhibiting antibodies. And, and that is, if you like, your standard of care, right? Now, we have mismatch years and we have non-responders and this sort of thing, but, but basically your standard of care is you have to think of it as a sort of well-matched whole or split influenza vaccine right, right. That, that gives you a, a decent antibody response. And we know that that protects. It's not fantastically efficacious throughout the population and in the elderly, you know, recent results say it's not as good as we would like it to be. But basically it protects. So what, what, it, what we do when we think about a cut down molecule and presenting a little piece of the stem mm -hmm. to get preferentially stem antibodies or a piece of the globular head that's a little bit buried that might, mm -hmm. that might give us more broadly neutralizing antibodies. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to get greater breadth and therefore longevity of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the immune response that's protective so that we can vaccinate for five years or 10 years instead of vaccinating every season, or are we trying to improve on the 60 or 70 percent efficaciousness that we have today with our seasonal vaccines? Maybe we're trying to do both. But I would say that if we, if we go for a, a, a five or ten year, we've got to be at least as good as the regular well-matched seasonal vaccines every year for those ten years for that to be, you know, a really viable alternative. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if we're trying to do better in terms of efficacy on a seasonal basis, we've got to match the standard of care and go on further. And so we've got to show superiority, which isn't easy in the clinic anyway. Sure, sure. And whether you, if you're trying to develop a, an improved seasonal vaccine, I'm not sure that, that going for a you know, conserved region of the hemagglutinin is the best strategy. I think I'd rather add cellular responses to give a, okay. a, a greater sure, solidity sure. of protection. And if you're going in the, you know, the longitudinal direction trying to get extra mileage, then you've, you're going to maybe use the cut down versions, but then you've got to match the standard of care. Right. And, right. Uh, so I don't think these, I don't think this is a trivial problem actually making an influenza universal vaccine. It's a bit like trying to make an HIV vaccine or, or indeed a, you know, hep C vaccine where you've got a lot mm -hmm. of variability to deal with. And we know you've had, you know, you've had monoclonals against HIV that are broadly neutralizing, yeah. you know, for quite a long time now, but we haven't got there in terms of having a, an antigen, a structured antigen, that preferentially delivers a polyclonal response mm -hmm. where the members of that polyclonal response do right. what those highly neutralizing yeah. monoclons right. do, right? right. It's the same challenge for flu. Sure. It's not trivial. So uh, what would you tell young people who are just training in the field and want to go into industry? How, what, what advice would you give to them? You know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of different things in industry that they can do. They can do regulatory affairs, clinical development, mm -hmm. they can do process development, um, you know, as well as then the basic R&D around immune responses and, and you know, how, how it would mm -hmm. work in, in the vaccine part. Um, so, you know, if you're not totally motivated by your project at PhD level and don't see yourself progressing scientifically, don't rule industry out because there are many diverse things there you can use yeah. that knowledge to do in a slightly different way so that's that's point one so even if you don't think you're very good you can still go into industry and find something that you will be good at um, but you know if you're good at the basic stuff as well you should mm -hmm. also consider industry but then you know don't you know don't lock yourself into one career as, as you know <laughs> tends to happen. I, for me, it was a big break jumping into industry after 
after 20 years as an academic. Quite a difficult jump. Um, but it's not one that you should be afraid to make. You should be, you know, mm -hmm. keep yourself flexible, try and broaden your experience, and then you can bring things to the industry by, by an ac a good academic experience. So stay flexible, I think, is my, is my um, advice to young, smart virologists. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations on the Colworth Award, and Thank thanks you. for talking with me. I appreciate Real your pleasure. time. Real pleasure.